going to invite you to go ahead and take a seat and grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Matthew. Chapter 25 is our text. We're continuing our series called The Moral of the Story, where we're looking at stories of Jesus and, and learning how they apply to us, what difference they make to us. And uh, so we're going to be Matthew 25. If you don't have a Bible with you, that's perfectly fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you if you're at Sweetwater Campus or McCulloch Campus. Uh, but if you're at Parker, then uh, there's a table at the back. Uh, just step back there. Grab one of those Bibles and turn to page 987, and you will find the text. Page 987, you'll find the text, Matthew 25, and, and be able to follow along and join with us in studying. But uh, also, whatever campus you're at, if you need a Bible— you want to read God's Word, but you don't have one, then please take one of those with you. It is our gift to you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, God will change your life. Uh, so who likes to take tests? Anybody like to take tests? Yeah, there's a couple of hands went up. We'll pray for you. Uh, <laughs> who would rather take a test than write a paper? Okay, now lots of hands go up because like me, you're lazy and uh, it's much easier to take the test, get it over with and, you know, just a little bit of studying instead of all that work of writing a paper. All right, let's just go ahead. How many of you would rather write the paper than take the test? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I like having you guys around, but I don't, uh, I, I can't relate to that. I'm, I'm always going to take the lazy way out. So uh, it's final exam season because, you know, uh, high school and, and college are moving into that finals kind of time period right after Thanksgiving. They got finals week coming up. And so uh, all of those students are studying and asking that crucial question. You guys know the question, right? What's going to be on the test? What's going to be on the test? Because if we're going to take the test, we want to know what's going to be on the test. Because the truth is, without a test, we wouldn't study. Well, I wouldn't study. How many of you are like me? If there wasn't a test, you really wouldn't study at all, right? The rest of you that think you would, uh, okay, we need to talk afterwards. But, uh, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't bother to learn the material unless it interested us. Unless it was, you know, just something that we were really delighted in. We wouldn't bother to look over the notes and, you know, all that kind of stuff. See, tests are means of providing accountability for education. That's how you know that you learn the stuff that you pass the test. It's really the same in life. Life is a series of tests. And, and the big final exam is before God. And all of us want to pass that test. I mean, that's the really big one. And, and uh, Jesus tells us a story in Matthew 25. He actually tells three stories in Matthew 25. And they're all preparation for the final exam. Can I just be honest with you about that? Uh, Pastor Joe preached on the first one last week, talking about being ready because Jesus is going to come back at a time you don't know. And, and if you haven't taken care of that salvation experience of, of placing your faith and trust in Jesus, then uh, it's too late. And, and then uh, we talked about the, the third uh, story uh, a few weeks ago when we talked about having that heart of compassion and putting it into action and actually demonstrating that you care for people by what you do. And today we're looking at the one in Matthew 25, beginning in verse 14. And all of these stories tell us what's going to be on the test. So we probably ought to pay attention when Jesus is telling us what is going to be on the test. Matthew 25, beginning in verse 14. Jesus says, for it, he's talking about the kingdom of heaven. For the kingdom of heaven will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more, but he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. 
And he also, who had the two talents, came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two more talents. And his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers and my coming. I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Parable of the talents. Today we're just beginning with the moral of the story. And, and I want you to know that God rewards effective managers. The moral of the story is that God rewards effective managers. And you can put other words in there if you're not comfortable with manager. You can use the word steward. You can use the word servant. Because the servants in the story managed the master's resources. And the servants that made a profit were commended. The one who didn't was condemned. Two servants passed the test. One servant failed. You see, notice the master didn't reward a lousy manager. The master did not reward a selfish owner. God rewards effective managers. Some of you are saying, so what? How does that relate to us? Well, there's three test points. Okay, and I want, to look, I want us to look at these because these are the things that are going to be on the test. And, and I'm going to call them crisis, if you will, that are in the story. But uh, if we pass these, then you'll ace the test. So we're trying to talk about what's on the test. By the way, those of you in the Parker campus, do you want to pass the test? At the McCulloch campus, do you want to pass the test? Yes. Okay, you're at the Sweetwater campus. Do you guys want to pass the test? Yes. All right. I hope they heard that. I don't know if you guys heard that or not. We're not they're not going to hear you because that's last night and tomorrow. Anyway, you all know that. Okay, so that we begin with the identity crisis. The identity crisis. We are managers. We are managers. Look again at the beginning of the story. For it, the kingdom of heaven will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. He entrusted to his servants his property. So did you notice the relationships in the story? Because there's two distinct relationships. There's master and there's servants. Okay, so who does the master represent? Who do you think? God. Yeah, God. The master represents God. So then who does the servants represent? Yeah, they represent us. So if you want to pass the test, then you have to get the identity correct first. So if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus actually is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and if you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead and you have made a commitment to following Jesus with your life, then you're a servant. You're a servant of the king. You're a servant of the master. You know, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is what? Lord. Now, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. And, and therefore, you have already agreed that God is your master and you are his servant. And as servants, God has put us in charge of his money and his resources. We manage God's stuff. That's our role. Okay? We're the managers of God's stuff. That means that we are not owners of but we're stewards. We're managers. Use the word that you're comfortable with. And, and, and see, I'm talking about this because this is foundational to our identity as followers of Jesus Christ. We need to get this. We need to understand this. We need to hold on to this if we're going to really live as those 
children of God. Because if it all belongs to me, I can do with it whatever I want. If it's your stuff, you can do with it whatever you want. But if it all belongs to God, then we better do what God wants us to do with it. You see why this is foundational? You've got to get the identity test correct. Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. The earth is the Lord and everything that's in it. It belongs to God. It's His. And I know some of us want to protest, but I built it. I earned it. I worked for it. Absolutely. I know you did. But who gave you life? Who gave you breath? Who gave you strength? Who gave you the brains to do it? Who gives you the talent and the wisdom and the skill and the clarity to make excellent decisions? It's God. You see, the big question is this. Are you living as an owner of your stuff or as a manager of God's stuff? Are you living as an owner of your stuff or a manager of God's resources? Because your answer will determine if you pass the test. Because we begin with an identity crisis, we're managers. And then we move to the second test point, if you will. And that's the resource crisis. The resource crisis. Because it's God who decides. It's God who decides. Again, the beginning of the story. Verse 15. The masters called the servants together. He entrusted to them his property. It says to one servant he gave five talents. To another he gave two talents. To another he gave one talent. Uh, each according to his ability. And then he went away. The master decided who got what. And the servants received differing levels of responsibility based on whose judgment? The master's judgment. Yeah, it was the master who decided. We know who the master is. That's God. We've already established that. And to one he gave five talents, to another he gave two talents, and to another he gave one talent. And I would remind you, we talked about this uh, a while back, a talent is a measure of money. It says it, you know, clearly in the text, you know, hid his money in the ground, we, you know, invested it, made five more talents. But we don't, we don't travel in talents. We don't trade in talents. None of us are saying, hey, how many talents do you get paid? Right? So we got to remind ourselves, what is a talent? Well, a talent equaled 15 years of a worker's wages. One talent equaled 15 years of a worker's wages. So I just put that in uh, today's money using minimum wage in Arizona. So the guy who got one talent got $343,000 to take care of. The guy who got two talents, he had $686,000 to take care of. The guy who got five talents, $1.7 million. Yeah, now, none of those are chump change. Can we just agree with that? I mean, if somebody came to you and said, hey, well, I want you to handle my $340,000 investment, uh, would you feel like, well, you're not trusting me at all? No, it'd probably make some of us uh, a little bit nervous. You want me to handle your money? Unless, of course, that's what you get paid to do. Well, these are servants, and so all of them received significant trust. All of them were entrusted with the master's possessions. He said, I trust you. I believe in you. I want you to take care of this for me. Because a lot of times we just kind of look at this and we start protesting. It's not fair. One got five talents, and I only got one talent. How come he got more than me? Instead of realizing that the master entrusted you, uh, we just get stuck on this hole. He got more than I got. By the way, this is the temptation of envy. If you're looking around thinking other people have more than you, that's envy. And, and this is a, living a life that is comparing and keeping score, and, and that always leads to failure. Can I just tell you that? If the focus of your life is keeping score and, and trying to see who you have more than and who has more than you and all this kind of stuff, then it, you're always going to be frustrated and angry and disappointed. It's going to lead to failure. You see, God decides the resources. We don't. God decides the resources. And he will entrust to his servants as he chooses. And by the way, God knows us. He made us. He is familiar with us. And to some of his servants, he gives money. 
because they're good at it. Okay? That's reality. To some of his servants, he gives people because they lead well. To some of his servants, he gives influence because they're excellent at teaching wisdom. To some, he entrusts the broken because they're great at healing people, whether that's physically or mentally or emotionally. To some, he entrusts talent, like our kind of talent, like America's Got Talent. Not like money talent, but talent like, you know, these people create beauty, whether it's musically or artistically. They have the ability to build or to make things happen or to provide help. And, and they just, they, they, they're the people who make the, the world go around. But see, God is the one who chooses which resources, which talents, if you will, to entrust to his followers. Our test, your test, my test, you know what that is? To rejoice in the talents that God gives you. That's our test, to rejoice in the talents that God has given you. Um, not lament the talents you don't have. Okay, let's just, let's just go ahead and confess a little bit together, okay? How many of you have ever listened to the people on the praise team sing and you think, I wish I could sing like that or play an instrument like that? Go ahead and join, join with me in confessing. Okay, I see those hands. Those of you that didn't raise your hands, you must already have talent, so why are you not on the praise team or working in the tech booth, okay? <laughs> I, I, I want to know that. So uh, here's the thing. I'm just going to confess to you that, uh, you know, God called me into ministry when I was 17 years old, and I felt like, you know, this is what God wanted me to do, and, and, uh, and so I said, okay, God, I'll, I'll do that. I'll serve you any way you want, but the way I want to serve you, God, is I want to be able to sing, okay? I love music. And I wanted to be able to sing. And when I say sing, I wanted to be able to sing well, like the people that were up here just a few minutes ago. And I worked really hard at, at, at being a singer, and I achieved musical mediocrity. <laughs> okay, that was my level. And, uh, and, and, it, and it finally came to a head, and, and I was in college, and and our church had a, a musical they were going to do, a youth musical. If you grew up in church, you know what I'm talking about. And, uh, and I got the lead in it. I get the lead in it because the guy with talent, he backed out like two weeks ahead. And they gave me the lead, and I thought, here's my chance. God's going to show up. The Holy Spirit's going to fill me. I'm going to sing like an angel. And I, I, I did the, you know, the play. We got finished. And uh, I'm like, yeah, I'm just, you know, that adrenaline's pumping and, and everything. And I said, so how'd I do? And my girlfriend, who's now my wife, uh, looked at me and smiled and said, you should probably never do that again. See, we all need that kind of truth in our lives. That's love right there. So I embraced the talent that God gave me. I think it worked out okay. You, you know what I'm saying? I, 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 I'm, I realize God's plans for us are better than our desires for us. And so we can always want to have different kind of talent. We can always want for other people's resources. But understand this. God has entrusted talent to you. He's given you his resources for a reason. And if you're lamenting your lack of talents, if you're busy comparing yours to people who have more, can I just point out that you have an abundance? I mean, personally, you're, you're gifted by God to do something that's going to make a difference in his kingdom. I know that because that's how God made us. You may not be thrilled with what you're good at, but you're good at something. And God wants to use it to glorify his name. But even beyond that, you have an abundance. Now, I know other people have more than you, but most people have less than you. You know why I know that? Because you live in the United States of America in 2019. You won the lottery of history because you have freedom and you have opportunity and you have luxury. Do you realize that, that people who live in poverty in the United States of America have more than 90% of the world? I mean, even if you're like, I don't have anything, you've got more. I'm just telling you, it's there. So rejoice in what God has given you. Because if you do, you'll pass the test. So we've got an identity crisis. We're managers, not owners. We, we've got the resource crisis. God decides what we're going to get. We decide whether to rejoice in that or not. And then finally, we have the accountability crisis. God expects growth. 
look again at verse 19. This is where uh, it says the master came home. It says, now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I've made five talents more. What did the master say? Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Wow. What a response. What a response. Now, there were two faithful servants. Those were the ones who experienced growth. Now, notice God didn't compare the total amount, just what they'd done with what he gave them. It didn't matter to, to the master if one had ten and one had four. He just said, you've, you've been excellent at what I entrusted with you. You've been faithful. He rewarded them the same. Um, and then uh, the one wicked, lazy servant preserved what he had. Uh, God expects us to grow. He expects us to be effective and productive for his kingdom. And honestly, I was not taught this in church. I wasn't taught this at all in church. And it kind of irritates me. I was taught an unbiblical definition of faithfulness. You know what that was? And some of you grew up in church, you're, you're going to recognize this. I was taught that faithful was showing up, not messing up, and uh, maintaining what you had. Showing up. I, faithfulness was you just attended church. The doors were open. You were supposed to be there. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Monday night for visitation, all of it. That was part of being faithful, showing up. Being faithful was not messing up. In other words, you weren't supposed to do any of the big sins that church people frowned on. You could do the sins that church people were good at, like gossip and lying and slander and hypocrisy, but don't do the big, you know, embarrassing sins that we all agreed were really messing up. And then maintaining. You just were happy that you didn't lose ground. But when I read the story the first time of the parable of the talents, do you know who that reminded me of, that definition of faithfulness? Which servant? Yeah, the wicked, lazy servant. That is not the one I wanted to be, by the way. And I kind of went, wow, God expects growth. And by the way, did you notice how the master replied to excuses? By the way, this stands out to me, and I want you to get this, because, again, I grew up in churches that when you actually ask them why we weren't making progress, why we weren't growing, that there was a litany of excuses, a whole bunch of excuses. Oh, well, that, that big church down the road, they're watering down the gospel. They're just not preaching the gospel. That's what it is. We're teaching the truth, and that's why people aren't coming. Really? Oh, well, we're just focusing on discipleship. We're not focusing on evangelism. Really? Well, how do you make disciples if you don't reach people and introduce them to Jesus Christ? Their lives can be changed so they can become followers. Because that's what a disciple is. Well, we're, we're more interested in quality than quantity. Oh, so you don't care that people go to hell? See, we can make all kinds of excuses, and, and, and here's the thing. The master didn't even respond to the excuses. I knew you to be a hard man. You reap whether you haven't sown. You gather where you don't. You know, look, I don't, he didn't even care. He didn't even say, it. Oh, you're wrong. He just said, you could have at least put it in the bank, and I'd have made some interest. You wicked, lazy servant. Throw him out. I mean, that's, that's harsh. So don't work on your excuses. Work on growing. Um, by the way, some of us excel at excuses. Can, can we just go ahead, and I'm not, I'm not going to ask you to confess. Can we just agree that all of us are, are pretty good at making excuses, but some of us, we just excel at making excuses. It's always somebody else's fault. There's always, we're always blaming someone else. It's never about what I did or what I chose. It's this, it's that. They're lucky and I'm not. Can I just tell you that if you excel at making excuses, you're going to fail? You're going to fail the test. You're going to fail in life. You're going to be miserable. You're not going to achieve what you want to achieve. You're not going to be able to glorify God the way that you want to glorify God. Excuses are not the answer. So God expects you to grow. So how are you growing? How are you growing? 
How are you growing in your relationships? Just take a moment. In your relationships, are you growing in your relationships? Are you, are you uh, investing in your marriage? If you're married here, praise God and don't take it for granted. Are you investing in your marriage? You go, well, yeah, you know, we're, we're both like in the same house. I, I, I told her I loved her like 10 years ago. I'll let her know if I change my mind. You know, are, are you investing in the relationship? Do you, are, are you even having enough conversation to know when times are not good? You know, we've got a marriage mentoring uh, ministry here at Calvary, and, and some of you probably need to sign up, not because your marriage is failing, but because your marriage is stale. And, and you need somebody to sit across from you and just ask you some questions about it because you invite them to do that. Marriage mentoring is not to rescue bad marriages. It's to make okay marriages good. And it's to make good marriages great. Counseling is for the ones that are desperate. Are, are you investing in your marriage at all? Do you have a date night? Do you, do you, you know, talk to each other? And, and are you investing in the relationships with your kids? Some of you are like, I'm a good parent. I drive them to all their soccer games. I'm there in the stands cheering them on. Yeah, but do you actually have a conversation with your kids? Or are you just a chauffeur? Maybe you should put the phone down and talk as a family. Are you investing in those relationships? What about with your friends? Are you investing in the relationships with your friends? You don't have friends. That's why you need a life group. <laughs> okay, join a life group. They have to like you. Well, they have to love you. They don't have to like you, okay? Some of you are testing that principle right now. Uh, Look, life groups, share life together, do life together, and, and invest in friendships. That way it's not always about you. Are you growing in your relationships? Honestly, do you love better than you used to? By the way, love is patient and love is kind. I, I, I worked on my patience Thursday night because we were dumb enough to go to Walmart. <laughs> yeah. Didn't get anything I went there for, forgot half the stuff, but uh, it's definitely an exercise in learning patience. So, uh, you know, but are you, are you loving better than you used to? Are you forgiving faster than you used to? Are you more merciful? Are you serving with more energy than you used to? See, all that's about growing in your relationships. Hey, do you know how you really know how you did in your relationship or how somebody did in their relationship? If you really want to know how somebody did in their relationships, go to their funeral and listen to what their spouse or their kids or their grandkids say about them. It'll tell you everything you need to know. And by the way, what do you want people to say at your funeral? What do you want your loved ones to say at your funeral? Now think about that. And then are you living in a way that's going to result in that? Because if not, there's time to grow in your relationships. You're still here, and, and we haven't taken the test yet. So invest in relationships. And, and are you growing in influence? Are you growing in influence? Calvary's mission is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through the love of his people and the power of his truth. Okay, that's our mission. That's what we're all about. And the only way that we're going to succeed is you growing your influence for Jesus. Let me say that again. The only way we're going to accomplish our mission, our unrealistic, crazy goal of 4,000 people coming to faith in the next eight years, uh, the only way that's going to happen is if you expand your influence for Jesus. Because you have family, you have friends, you have neighbors, you have coworkers who haven't yet experienced a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. You have been entrusted with influence in their lives. Look, I know some of you are like, well, I, I, you know, I'm going to tell them about church. They don't care about church. They don't go to church. Well, I, I want them to meet the preacher. They don't care about me. Look, I've not yet to meet somebody who's unchurched that was impressed that I'm a pastor. All that does is like make them feel awkward. Like they suddenly start apologizing for every third word they say or something. <laughs> Makes everybody in the room uncomfortable. They don't, they don't care about me. They don't care about what the Bible says. You can thump them with the Bible all you want. Well, the Bible says they don't care. They don't believe in it. That's for us, for believers. You know what they care about? 
You. They know you. They trust you. They believe you. They're watching your life. And if your life points to Jesus, they're going to see that. So are you investing in leading your friends, your coworkers, your neighbors to Jesus? By that I mean, are you praying for them that God would open their heart and, and, and work with them? Are you inviting them to come with you to church? And if so, and they say yes, are you talking to them afterwards? Are you modeling a grace-filled life? Are you modeling what it is to have authentic faith in Jesus Christ? In other words, that's a nice way of saying, are you not being a hypocrite in front of them? See, that's influence. Because if we're faithful with influence, do you know what God will give us more of? It's not a trick question. Influence. You've been faithful with a little, I'll put you in charge of much. If you're faithful with influence, then God will give you more influence. And then are you growing your resources? Your relationships, your influence, and your resources. Because all of us have money. Now, some of us have very little and some have a lot. Are you spending your money? Or are you investing God's money? Now, think about that. Are you spending your money or are you investing God's money? Because uh, God gifted some of you with the ability to make a bunch of money. And why did he do that? So you could just indulge yourself Spend it on what you want or to use to invest in the kingdom. I've heard some teachers call that the spiritual gift of generosity. That God gives some people the ability to make money so that they can support kingdom work. Uh, by the way, Calvary is a great investment in the kingdom. We've got so many ministries of life change. I don't have time to name them all. We celebrate baptisms. Last year, uh, you know, we led our state, uh, Arizona Southern Baptist Convention, in baptisms again. Uh, we build up families and marriages. We have Celebrate Recovery. We do missions. All of those things. I love Celebrate Recovery people. They're always excited. You mention them, they just cheer. But for you to invest, you have to actually see your resources as belonging to God and you as the manager. Otherwise, you'll see it as your money and you'll spend it however you want. But remember, God rewards effective managers. People who are growing their relationships and their influence and their resources. Not lazy managers and not selfish owners. And one day, we're all going to take the final exam. Okay, I don't know if that's going to be because we breathe our last in this world or because Jesus comes back and takes us. It doesn't matter to me. One day, we're all going to stand before God and give an account can I just be honest? I want to do more than just pass the test. I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what I want to hear. And I want you to pass with flying colors too. I want you to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And you can. Because now you know what's on the test. You can prepare for the test. And some of you are saying, but you don't understand. I've blown it for all these years. I've, I haven't done these things you're talking about for all these years. God's grace abounds. God's grace is enough. He forgives us of all of our sins. But here's the thing. You can start today. You can begin a new chapter in your life today saying, Jesus, I want to be that effective manager. I want to be that faithful manager. I want to take care of your resources. I want to repent of my selfishness. I want to do things for you. I want to do it your way. But you got to decide. Yeah, I'm going to do that. Because I want to make a difference in my life and in my family and in my community. And if you want to make a difference, then you have to decide that you're going to be that faithful servant instead of just making excuses. I don't know about you, but I choose to make a difference instead of making excuses. I pray that you will also. Let's pray together. Father, thanks. Thanks for loving us incredibly. Thanks for the, the grace uh, that is given to us by Jesus, that salvation comes from him. And God, you know every one of us fails in this attempt to, to be effective managers. We just want to be better for you. We want to build up your kingdom in every way possible. So speak into our lives. Help us to get the identity right. 
Help us to praise you for the resources you've given to us. And God, help us to grow as individuals and as a ministry. We know that we can't do it without you. So we surrender completely to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.